Assalamu alaikum. May the peace and blessings of God be with you. My name is Sue Obeidi, and I am the director of the Muslim Public Affairs Council's Hollywood Bureau, and PAC Hollywood Bureau for short. We work in the industry to change the narrative around Muslims and Islam. For more information on our organization, please visit mpachollywoodbureau.org. Today's panel, Tropes and Truths, a conversation on Afghan Americans, industry, and the making of the United States of Al is in partnership with the Afghan American Foundation. Due to prevailing circumstances, the United States of Al, which is on Thursday nights on CBS, is one of the most important shows on television right now. And on behalf of MPAC's Hollywood Bureau and on behalf of the Afghan American Foundation, we are honored to bring you this discussion today. Before I hand it over to my friend, my colleague, and board member of the Afghan American Foundation, Joseph Azam, I just wanna thank the moderator, our panelists, and all of you for tuning in today. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the conversation. Joseph. Thank you, Sue, um, and thank you uh, to MPAC for its partnership on this event. Uh, Sue mentioned my name is Joseph Azam. I'm a lawyer, uh, also a board member of the Afghan American Foundation. Uh, I wanted to just briefly start off today by talking about two things. One, I wanted to mention what our foundation does. And then two, uh, I wanted to talk about why we thought this event was critical in this moment. Um, our foundation is a nonpartisan um, uh, nonprofit organization focused on thought leadership, um, advocacy, and public engagement for the Afghan American community. Um, and when this opportunity came up, you know, we realized that um, this is probably the most important moment uh, in our diaspora uh, so far. Uh, and, um, and it was one that we wanted to um, capitalize on. So, you know, who is our constituency? Um, by conservative estimates, there are around 400,000 Afghans currently in the United States. That number is expanding, as you all probably know. Um, about 34% of them are born in the U.S., everybody outside, everybody else outside, and most, most of everybody else born in Afghanistan. Um, but they're not our only constituency. Um, based on a, a UN population division estimate in 2020, um, there are almost 6 million Afghans uh, who are outside of Afghanistan living as refugees under other different status. So um, part of why we wanted to have this conversation is because we think that the work that the folks you're going to hear from doing tonight, tonight are doing uh, is going to impact those people as well. Uh, it's not going to affect just Afghans in the U.S. It's going to affect the 6 million who are outside. And it's going to affect them in the following ways. Um, I think in this moment in particular, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done around narrative building and narrative development. Sue mentioned that. Um, for us, particularly given the, the situation with the rivals uh, and the refugees that are going to be coming to the U.S., um, there's a lot of work to be done around ensuring that their transition is smooth and the reception is the one that they deserve. Um, and interestingly, there was a study that came out, a press release, I think this week, um, from the Migration, Migration Policy Institute, and it talked about, you know, what are the factors of building immigrant narratives? And there were a couple of things that I think are really relevant for our conversation tonight, and I think Lorraine's going to touch on. But one is that um, top-down doesn't work. So our leaders can say what they want to say, but ultimately, um, you know, the way narratives are built are based on people's lived experiences. And so, you know, what shapes those understandings, what shapes those narratives for people, and what really tugs on their heartstrings is some of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, the second is, you know, the type of insecurities that our communities are going to be dealing with. Um, those are driven by insecurities around economics, culture and identity, uh, personal safety or national security. And I think the uh, United States of Al actually touches on all of those in very significant ways. Uh, and we want to be a part of the conversation that helps um, shape that, that work. Um, and finally, I think the, the window is small. And our foundation talks about this a lot. Um, there's always a tipping point between acceptance and insecurity. And so for us, you know, this is a really important window for our community to really double down on acceptance, um, getting people to understand who's coming into their communities and invest um, in a community that's been in the U.S. for a long time, but is growing uh, at a rapid pace. So um, we're grateful for this opportunity, certainly for the creative folks uh, and the, the talent who we're going to be hearing from today, and uh, most of all for our moderator, moderator Lorraine Ali. Uh, Lorraine is a television critic from Los Angeles Times. Uh, she's an award-winning journalist um, who's an LA native. She's written publications ranging from the New York Times to GQ to Rolling Stone uh, and was formerly the Times music editor and before that a senior writer and a critic for Newsweek magazine. So Lorraine, we're privileged to have you guide this conversation uh, and with this and with deep gratitude, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, and thank you all for tuning in and being here. Um, 
It's just, I cannot think of a more timely television show to be talking about right now. And a little background on United States of Al, in case you don't know, um, it is a half hour comedy and it follows the friendship of a uh, Marine who served in Afghanistan and his former interpreter, Al, who he brings over, um, you know, it, it takes, it's very difficult to bring him over. Um, and they settle with his, with Riley's father in Columbus, Ohio, and all sorts of stuff happens. It's fun. It's funny. But uh, it's also incredibly topical. So uh, let's just jump right in because the second season just kicked off this month and there's plenty to talk about. Um, so I'd like to first introduce um, Riza Aslan, who's the executive producer. Reza, there you are. Hello. <laughs> um, and Mehad Tusi, who's also executive producer and writer. And if I'm leaving something out, if, you know, writer, creator, please jump in, correct me. Um, Azita Ganazada, and I'm sure I just screwed that up, and I'm so sorry if I did. Um, she plays Ariana in the show. Hello. And last but not least, Fahim Anwar, who plays Mo. He's also a stand-up comedian here in Los Angeles. Very funny. Um, no pressure, but you just need to be funny. Okay. No, so I'm no pressure. On. Okay. Um, so I just want to start off, you know, with while you're making the second season. What is the timing here? Because I was watching the first episode and the first episode of the second season, you know, may have been Reza, you're looking at, you know, essentially you're, you're, you're looking at um, Al's sister being trapped in Afghanistan as the Taliban's taking over. So I can't imagine this was the plan <laughs> to kick off the second season with this. Can you just talk about, did you have to like rip up the plan and how fast was it to like put that, put that episode together? Well, we knew from the moment that President Biden announced that he would go along with um, the former guy's uh, plan to remove all troops from Afghanistan that we were gonna have to address that. This show, even in the first season, um, was constantly addressing the changing political landscape, uh, both here in the US and in Afghanistan. So we had made kind of a long term plan about how we were going to address those, um, the, the, the changing situation, we, I think, internally, just kind of assumed as awful as it sounds to say that uh, the Taliban was going to take over the country, we even had an amazing scene with Azita actually and Adir um, in an episode in the first season in which we just flat out said, this is going to happen. We just thought we would have more than a weekend before uh, it happened. And so while the scripts that we had written and produced um, had the that assumption in the background, um, we did with the fall of Kabul, the sudden fall of Kabul, have to just rethink um, at least that first um, episode and how we were going to address it. And really, we just took the cue from the Afghan writers and producers in the room, many of whom had vulnerable family members in Afghanistan that were desperately trying to get out. And so in a weird way, it was kind of one of these life imitates art kind of uh, situations, or maybe it's art imitates life in this situation, because yeah. we were, we knew we were going to write about it. We knew even that we were going to set it, set the episode during the fall of Kabul. Um, but when it came time to figuring out exactly what the story was going to be, we started looking around and seeing the situation with the vets in our room and the Afghans in our room working together um, with people on the ground in Afghanistan and other um, uh, uh, people around the world in order to, you know, get these family members out. And we thought that's our story. That's the story right wow. there. And so we began to write an episode that was essentially um, a fictionalized version of the very real trauma that we were dealing with in the writer's room. See, and I think that's what, one of the things that's so important about the series is that and it, it boils us down too far, but like humanizing the situation, right? It's not just, you know, the media jumping in for, you know, the moment that they do in Afghanistan because they ignored it for the last, whatever, 15 years. Um, but 
it is, it is, you know, humanizing this situation. It's putting a face on it. It's showing you these stories of what's going on behind it. And I can assume the writers and perhaps all of you have stories coming out of Afghanistan, of family members, of people you know. Um, may I, what is it, like, this is a comedy, right? But obviously this is not, what do you do when it's, when the moment is not funny? <laughs> Uh, look, I think we we had a very um, when Afghanistan when the Taliban took Herat, which was sort of Thursday before the weekend when uh, Kabul fell. We had a conversation, which you know, which was okay. Look, this is going to happen a lot faster, and and it was not just about what do we do about the show. It's also we have. 10 Afghan colleagues and we've got veterans, some of whom served in Afghanistan. And so, you know, there are some things you're trained for. There are other things you're not like, how do you deal with mental health stuff? And how do you actually sort of uh, what, how do we deal with this situation? You know, some of our colleagues are people who have very direct links, ongoing links. Some are people who, you know, who are more diaspora who've left for a long time, but, still have emotional and uh, ties to the homeland, but some li quite literally had family members who they felt responsible for because they were there because they told them they should go and do a job there, for instance. I mean, it was a very, very delicate situation. And, and so going into it, um, first it was like, okay, what do we do? Um, and it was to listen to the Afghans um, in the room um, to see how they felt uh, and try to, just cope with what was happening. This was Monday, right? So it was when all of those horrific images were coming in, we were all in the room together. And so it was just really, it, at that point, it was just really about holding each other up. Um, you know, those of us, like I worked in conflict zones for years. I was in Afghanistan uh, for six months between 2002 and 2003. Um, uh, and, uh, and other, you know, for me, like there, I can assure, like, I, like, it was re-traumatizing. Like I, my PTSD was coming back like wow. that weekend and that week, you know, so I, so this was happening and what was happening was very real. We weren't really thinking about the funny part of it. It was okay. So what do we do? Uh, how do we do this in a responsible way where we actually think about sort of ourselves and the situation that was affecting our, our colleagues. And then out of that process, as Reza said, came both the realization of what is the story, but also sort of, the realization that we don't need to write to jokes. Not everything, there is no comedy here. Um, and and Maria, who's our uh, one of the two showrunners, you know, she said, you know, let's not do it. Let's not write to jokes. We don't need to write it. We don't need to have one single joke, you know, but it's, you know, so we knew. And then what was amazing was that it was echoed, Chuck echoed the same exact sentiment to the four of us when, when Maria, Dave, Reza and I went up to talk to Chuck, to talk to Chuck. He was like, don't, you know, forget about jokes. We're going to get rid of, let's get rid of the laugh track. And it was like, okay, great. You know, it was, it was a, it was such a interesting experience because it connected it, it, tragedy in some ways, sometimes, you know, has this impact of collect connecting people. And this tragedy really connected all of us. And at the same time as we were in the writer's room doing this stuff, you know, Azita and Fahim and, uh, who's always with us in the writer's room was actually on stage because they were rehearsing the episode that plays on Thursday. So, mm -hmm. so there was the Afghans who were with us, you know, not in, not on, not on the stage, but in this building where we are now. And then there were the four Afghans who were on set, you know, perform, you know, doing the yeah. episode that we're going to watch on Thursday. So nobody, you know, from the PAs to all of the crew to everyone in the writer's room, all the way up, uh, to the execs at CBS and Warner, no one got to go through the experience of that week and the fall of Kabul without being directly in proximity and in communication with Afghans who, uh, which changes things. It, it really, really has an impact. You can't, you know, it's one thing to watch a conflict on, from your couch at home or from thousands of miles away. It's another thing when someone you know that you communicate with is directly impacted by it in a way that our colleagues were, um, and and that changed that changed all of us. And I think that you know we had uh, you know at that point we I think we knew that we were going to be okay. 
Mm-hmm. Um, at least in, we're going to be okay uh, figuring it out how it goes. But we didn't know what was going to happen on the ground, right? The tough part was, all right, how is this going to, like, we didn't know what was going to happen the next day. We didn't know, right. like, were there going to be any flights out? Like, you, how do you write a rescue story? Will there be a rescue? You know, who are they going to leave behind? You know, we knew people were going to be left behind, but who? So there was such a level of complexity and it was all happening so quickly. You know, sitcoms, we do 22 episodes a year. It's madness, right? We're working week in and week out. Like, so mm-hmm. we're already working at a crazy schedule. Suddenly, in the middle of that, having to write a new episode and, and you know, with everything that was happening at the same time and trying to also, you know, help whoever we could in all, in all the ways that we needed to. Uh, you know, we took us two weeks to write the episode. We wrote the, ep- you know, we delivered the episode the, the day of the end of the deadline, August 31st, when the when mm. Americans pulled out. Um, and then we had a table read that Friday. And then once the table read happened and the actors actually performed it, um, uh, which with net, when everybody at CBS was watching because obviously they were concerned about how we were going to take this on. Everybody right. was watching uh, because we got texts and messages afterwards. And, you know, and we were all like, you know, like what I was, I was telling Reza when we were on set is like, I took all of my energy not to start like belly crying <clears throat> during yeah. a table read, you know, because it was A, the, 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 the weeks preceding it was so difficult you know, these were not unfamiliar words. We were working on, you know, we were, it was so much work to put that episode together. And, but experiencing it was, it was really, really incredibly difficult, but, but also liberating and just seeing how the crew was impacted by it. Um, yeah. And how and everybody it, came together and all the hugs. It was, it was really something. It does it. It really, it does capture the, the real urgency of that moment and the not knowing. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, Azita and Fahim, but Azita first, just in terms of people use representation, the word a lot and throw it around, but here it really, really matters, especially right now with the series handling a situation like this. You have been, um, you've, you've done a lot of TV. You've done a lot of film. What did it mean to be involved in something that where there's actually representation behind the camera, in front of the camera. I mean, it is, it sounds basic, but it's so rare. I, thanks for the question, Lorraine. Um, and thanks for your question to my head as well. I, I think I just wanted to um, piggyback on something that he said that even though this is a sitcom, I think the show is strongest in its moments of endearment and truth. Um, I think that that show has, the show has really represented itself covering the landscape of important things um, in a in a meaningful way, and so even though it, it is a sitcom and they do write for the jokes, I think when they write for the heart, it's one, it's one of those. You know, it's something that that happens rarely because it's it's something that's occurring right now. It's very meta. It's very odd um, to be experiencing this while you're living it. Um, yeah, you know, we talk about representation matters, and a lot of the time that's just a, something that is performatory. Um, you know, people do it so they can put, you know, a black person or a Latin person there. And that one person is responsible for representing everybody of that specific identity. And that's how the, you know, question and answer has been, you know, solved by that kind of performative representation. Um, And throughout my years in the business, there have been many opportunities to play Afghan and like war things and, um, a number of narratives that just like, I didn't want to continue to be a part of that kind of storytelling. So experiencing, you know, a number of Afghans in Hollywood is, is so rare for me because I was always the one, the only one um, in, in any set, in any room, um, kind of championing along our culture and saying, this is where I am. I'm not going to change that. I'm not going to hide that. Uh, so to have this group of people there, specifically during this time, you know, last season, I think coming in as Ariana and expressing the things that needed to be expressed from her is still, I still wasn't sure, you know, where she was and, and what she was doing and what was going on with everything. But specifically this season, having this kind of collective community be able to raise their voice and not allow people to turn off the TV 
you know, to, to turn to tune out of just the news, right? It's disappearing from headline news. But every week there's just a little bit more that CBS is doing and we get to see a little bit more from like a little bit more of these mentions about Afghanistan and it's it's making people more curious. So that's been really lovely. But to be there the week that um, Kabul collapsed, I, I just don't know how anybody was really functioning. Um, and we were lucky to have each other and to be able to disappear into doing, creating some art. Um, yeah. those moments where we could put our head down and create some art together. But um, the, the creators and the, the showrunner were very mindful to take breaks. Um, they knew that I, you know, a lot of us had been working around the clock on evacuations and things like that. So they were very mindful to say, take breaks. If you need to go sit down, if you need a minute, also, you know, on the phone, like I'd be, I'd leave my phone in the dressing room and after a, a break, I'd run back to and I would be doing things on the computer and trying to uh, help a number of people, even I think probably on this panel and, and members of the, you know, um, Afghan American Foundation, trying to help them figure out what's going on, get communication on the ground, what's going on in Kabul, how can we help, who can we help, um, who can get on flights, how, can, who can we get money for in that space and then go back to set and and play in the story and, and really, I think also hold uh, people accountable and responsible of like, we have this honor of being able to share this human story. And so we're gonna try our best to do it and to make these important moments matter. And then also try and create some levity and, and show Afghans in a way that they've never been shown on television before. Right, and I wanna talk about this a little later, but particularly women, because that, uh, that is like a big mystery to many Americans and especially in scripted television, it's abysmal the way that that's been handled. We can, we can tackle that a little later in this conversation, but yeah, I mean, I'm so thankful that that is here in this series. Um, so Fahim, what was it like for you or what is it like for you being involved in this series? Cause I know also you're, you can tell you can correct me if I'm wrong, but doing stand up, doing comedy, I mean, I can imagine also being an actor, some of the roles that have been out there for you, has it been like terrorist number one, terrorist number two, or is it, has it been like, what has it been? I mean, that's definitely always on the table, you know, that's just a given, like if you want that, that is there. But uh, I've always made a very conscious decision when I entered the entertainment industry that I didn't want to do that. And I think I was lucky that I had stand up as an outlet and that was like a path for me to forge down. So I wasn't reliant just purely as an actor to, because some, some that's their only way in and those are the only roles being offered. But I had stand up, so I was able to just tell my people that I don't want to go out for any terrorist roles because that doesn't help me as a comedian or what I'm trying to build as an artist. Um, but then it's very cool to work on a show like this where there are roles for people of color and Afghans and such where these are three-dimensional characters and they are portrayed in a nuanced and positive light. And I posted a picture today, as did as well, just, you know, the episode for this week, the first Afghan family on television where we're just, through, we're just a normal Afghan family on an American sitcom TV show, which is insanity. I never thought like when I first got in the biz that I would ever see that you know, on a Thursday night. And it's cool to be in the writer's room as well to, and the other Afghan writers as well to flesh out these stories and inject our upbringing and our point of view. And you see it with promises, like a, a writer's room without the, the composition that ours has, a promise is it doesn't get made. And that's like, a, I think a watershed moment in television really, and also for Afghans because it's, it's a very nuanced portrayal and very real of what was going on. And if you don't have Afghans in the room, that, that story doesn't get told. Hmm. And why, so why not, in, in, to start with, like when you're thinking about, you know, making this, pitching this, having, putting this out there, why not go for like a nichier streamer type thing? Because this is like, you know, this is reaching really mainstream. And I could say, yes, great, grand. And that could be the idea. Yes, it's grand that it can do that. 
but it's also super risky, right? Because a niche or streamer, you know, because you know, everyone's like, what about Rami? What about, you know, whatever it is. I mean, you know I was going to bring that up, right? Yeah, <laughs> those are great so, shows. We love those shows. And, yeah, and, they're great. And we we but, love what they're able to do in that medium, you know? There's yeah. a there's a luxury of the one hour single cam or or just single cam that's more grittier on cable. But then there's also there's a further reach with network. Like you can't take as many risks and be as nuanced as you can with those shows that we love as well. But you're able to kind of like hit hearts and minds of people who would normally be closed off to even knowing someone like this. And like giving a human portrayal is is like there's value in that as well, you know. It's funny, the American sitcom through history has been one of the things that has broken ground for new identities, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't really think of that, but if we really look throughout time, the American sitcom from like Norman Lear and, you know, moving forward, like MASH and all of these things, even to Blackish and to Fresh Off the Boat, they, you know, created this, these, it's, it's complicated, right? Because it's a, especially when it's a new storyline, Afghans on a sitcom, then the people get nervous about the jokes and who's the butt of the joke and who's responsible for the joke and all of those other things. But really kind of breaking through that American sitcom and then bringing them into your home every week creates this kind of different kind of like familial value in the fabric that is American culture. So it's interesting to have the sitcom and have it be focused in this kind of Afghan American lens and Afghan lens part of the time um, that the show does because it is, it then becomes a fabric of American culture through that where these kinds of nuanced dramatic award, you know, these are incredible shows that like we love, but I think that being a part of something like a, a sitcom is historical more so than just the normal one hour drama that we normally see. Hmm. Yeah, and you're this introducing is, people. Trying to do it. Sorry, you're introducing people to the family as well. Whereas like Rami, who's a friend and I love the show, sometimes it's preaching to the choir. Like the people who watch it for the most part are already very open-minded and, and accepting of the idea. Whereas this may actually hit some people who <laughs> Who, who didn't think that way or, or maybe weren't as accepting to say an Afghan family on television. Yeah, look, Reza and I have been doing this, um, God, 2005, you know, um, and um, the, we always knew, look, we don't do, you know, we have many projects that are in many different places. Uh, and, uh, and so we've always been very agnostic in terms of, the kind of things that we do. But one thing has always been clear is, all right, we need to, it was really important to figure out a sitcom formula that would work. And and this is the third time. Is our third, yeah, it's our third attempt. Third attempt. Uh, on, and, this, uh, on this one or? Uh, did, were no, 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 in general. In, general, general, in terms of the sitcoms. And so, <laughs> yeah, so 12, 12, you know, 12 years, 12, 13 years and wow. three sitcoms. And this is the third one. and. You know, so it's not an, it's, first of all, it's incredibly difficult to tell a story 22 minutes. Um, you know, that's, that's how much time we have. And so it's not that it's any easier or it's a, it's just a different form. And then you consider the fact that it's multicam and live audience is a lot more like promises in many ways, feels like a play, you know, a two set play uh, where, uh, you know, in, you know, so it's a different medium of storytelling. It's one that is very accessible. It allows you to tell stories about characters and um, in a way that is easily digestible and understood. Um, it uses comedy, which is probably the most important way of actually communicating difficult, complicated things. <laughs> um, it doesn't make it easier, uh, but it, uh, it and and so. You know, it was a no-brainer, really. Um, I think a lot of times, a network, you know, network is very specific. Who it reaches, the legacy that it has, the part of the country that it reaches, the oh. the, the the depth and breadth of the nature of the audience. And, you know, we knew that we had already a built-in audience of millions, and we just had to make sure that we make it millions more so that we can stay on air, right? That's That was 
but that's a that's nothing to you know if you know we come from a part of the world in which storytelling and has everything to do with being a better human being and living in a better society they're not divorce things like the idea of entertainment for entertainment's sake does not really compute because every story i ever heard was always about what was it about and why did you hear it and so that's the part of the world that we come from mm -hmm. um storytelling is part and parcel to community building and living in a society that is healthy um and learning how to be a better human being etc all of those things and so um you know the we've never been highbrow about, oh, this story is better than that kind of a story or that you need to be complicated in order to be good. Or, you know, you know th those terms are, I think, misused and thrown around and weaponized, sadly, in some ways in these days, where really the important thing is, I'm going to tell a story like, you know, you had a, you know, you had to show up in a village, tell a story, and hopefully you didn't get, you know, pelted with eggs and tomatoes and you went on to the next one. Like, that's what storytelling was. And that storytelling you had to entertain the people. You had to give them something to, so that they let you in the back, you know, so the elders let you in the next time you came around. And, um, and you had to, you know, do it in a meaningful way and, and, and move on. So that's, I think that's the tradition of storytelling that we care about and we come from. And, and sitcoms are, are the height of that in many ways, you know? And, and so, yeah, there's nothing, we, we're, we're, <laughs> this, was, this was huge for us that it actually, we were able to get a sitcom on air like this and to have this team and, to be able to put it together in this way. It's just a dream come true. And the, the sitcom, um, somebody chimed in in the chats. And I just like, when we talk, when Fahim and I talk about like it not being as niche as like a one hour drama and the audience that it reaches, we just mean that, you know, audiences in general throughout um, in the primetime, the hour, they don't necessarily have um, access to a lot of Afghans, right? So unless they're seeing them on the news and then what we're seeing on the news is usually hysteria and chaos. Mm -hmm. It's war and displacement. It's um, stories that are are a part of the, the, the culture or it's, or it's a terrorist narrative or, you know, it's, it's violent in some way, shape or form. And so that's the only information they have. So being on a, a primetime sitcom provides the 7 p.m. nightly news viewer who stays on and watches the CBS sitcom, the opportunity to actually see the real, like a human, human side of an Afghan family here in the United States, as opposed to what they saw on the seven o'clock news. Right. And what were, you know, well, first off, how, how did Chuck Lorre, I'm sure you've talked about this, but how, how did that happen? That's amazing because <laughs> for those of you out there who don't know who he's like the king of sitcoms, like, you know, Big Bang Theory, Third Rock, I mean, he is the man. How, how did that happen? Well, I'd been friends for many, many years with um, Dave Getch, who's along with Maria Ferrari, co-creator of uh, United States of Al. <clears throat> Dave, a uh, longtime writer on the Big Bang Theory. Um, and he and I have always wanted to work together. Um, we've been friends, as I say, for a long time, but of course he was, you know, very much stuck in the, in with the, what the golden handcuffs that was the Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. um, but when they announced their final season, it, it was kind of right around then that he started thinking to himself, okay, what do I want to do next? Um, you know, the thing about Chuck is he's got this whole farm league going on, right? You know, where he just kind of develops these writers and he brings them in and he makes, he starts them off with staff writers and slowly moves them up. And then a lot of his shows, in fact, I think actually all of his shows, his current shows um, are run by people who were staffed on previous shows. Uh. And so I think Dave understood that one, he wanted to do something meaningful that he wanted to work with us, um, and two, that he knew how to how to get Chuck to be excited about something. And the one thing that I'll say about Chuck Laurie is that, you know, at a certain point, you you've you've got all the accolades, you got all the money in the world, you've set all the records. You know what I mean? Like, what do you want to do next? Is is I think you know the, where he's at. And when we brought him the idea for this show. Uh, to his credit, I mean, he immediately jumped at it. Um, and at every stage of the way, interestingly, he's the he's been the one who has been pushing us to 
to sort of push the boundaries and to do things in a different way. And sometimes, you know, we, we find ourselves like we're the ones who are thinking to ourselves, well, is this what a sitcom would do? And he's like, who cares what a sitcom would do? Let's, let's do something else. Um, so it's a, it's a huge benefit to have someone um, who has that much power uh, and who has already done everything and just wants to do something different and new um, and who also gives you kind of the freedom, once he trusts you, gives mm -hmm. you the freedom um, to, to sort of really make your voice heard. So it's no exaggeration to say that I don't think any of this would have worked without Chuck Lorre. I think if we had taken this project to any other network, they would have thrown us out of the room. They would have been like, get the hell out of here. We're not doing this. <laughs> um, but uh, once you have Chuck on your side, then you know you can pretty much do whatever you want to it. <laughs> you have the juice, right? <laughs> um, and then can you just talk a little bit about the the reaction from different communities when the series first premiered? Um, from Afghan community, from because the reactions were very different coming from different areas. And I, I wrote a piece about this when it came out. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, look, we have been doing this for a long time. We're also ourselves uh, the, you know, we, we, we know the Hollywood, can, what Hollywood do adversely. Um, you know, so the, the trauma is something that we connect with and understand. And so when the show was announced, there was, um, the marketing stuff started coming out, which is not the show, it's the marketing around the show. And, and there, were, there was uh, obviously the natural backlash by all the people who carry in their body the trauma of having to be Muslim or from the Middle East or uh, who have seen uh, their identity sort of dragged through the mud. And, uh, and obviously you think of a sitcom, which is sort of a primetime sitcom on a Thursday night at 8.30, this, you know, it, it just scares people in all the ways that that, that does. And, and so that did happen. Um, what was interesting was that, uh, you know, obviously this was our first rodeo. We've been around for a long time and we've been doing stuff with various different uh, identities within what we call sort of our collective identity, which is from the greater Middle East, a part of the world where there's always been a traditional storytelling and a fluidity that was borderless, right? Um, and, and so we always felt that there was a commonality between, in, across this part of the world that had to do with culture that predated even the religion itself. Um, and, you know, so, so, so we've been down this road before with many communities and specifically also with the Afghan community and, and, and so much of what we do is about making sure that you engage uh, into conversations with, uh, with the community and that you that they are aware of what you're doing and and that you uh are in some sort of a thought partnership it you know uh, with also the people who can benefit from what you're doing right as artists who are also activists like i call us artists slash activists because i think those two things are separate things that need to be you can't wear those two hats at the same time you have to keep taking them off and putting the other one on um uh, azita does it really well as you can see in this episode on Thursday, which is unbelievable <laughs> that she actually was able to do it like that. But as artists slash activists, um, you know, for us, it was, it's really important to think about, all right, you know, you're going to create a piece of content that actually is going to affect people, uh, open their hearts, have them see the world in a different place, be activated by it in somehow. And then how do you actually then pass the baton to people who are doing the real work, right? If we are in the consciousness space of actually changing people's hearts and minds and making them more receptive to certain things. And then who are the people who are actually doing the real work or working with people on the ground who are trying to make changes on the policy side, on, on the legal side, on the activism side, on the outreach side, and, and make sure that we have a relationship with them so that they can be more effective and we can support them in that way. And so we'd already started these conversations. We'd already had one sort of a meeting with the Afghan community. And we had another one that was that Monday after the sort of the, the, the uh, trailer came out. That was already pre-scheduled, obviously. And, and so it was really interesting to preview the episodes 
with with the community and then be in that conversation with them and he really hearing all that feedback and, and so much of it was anxiety that we could relate to and understand um but i think generally speaking what we have heard from the afghan community has been overwhelmingly positive especially the ones who are here who can see the show itself um and what we said from the beginning was look you know that's a trailer we we've got 13 episodes in the first season now 22 episodes and we get to tell a long story you know we can't fit everything into 22 minutes um and that's not the way it works right so you know uh, and judge us by what we accomplish in the course of this show and we're in an open conversation and we we're happy to be in that conversation mm -hmm. yeah and i think there's also that thing of like you said you know People are raw. I mean, we see, I'm Iraqi, you know, Muslim, and if seeing yourself or not seeing yourself on screen or seeing yourself or your family or the people you love or the area you're from, seeing it so misrepresented for so long, you're waiting for that thing to correct it. And the idea that one thing is going to just correct it all, like it, it just carries a lot of weight. You know what I mean? There's a lot of expectations. And I think it's just like impossible for anything to do that, um, let alone, I mean, I just think it, there's a lot of expectation and hope and that's really hard. It's just hard. It's hard and it's, that's what I was saying. It's, it's, it's brave and it's risky to do a series like that because of that as well as it's being misinterpreted by more mainstream or it being, you know, it, there's all those things and you guys have threaded that needle, so. Congratulations on that, because that is not easy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I, I think also just Lorraine, like our community has just been through so much trauma, like specifically Afghans for 40 years, like most of us are displaced. Like there's just, there's so much trauma. And like you said, that fear and everything that comes with that, that's living in their body of like, how are we going to be talked about? Like we, we don't want this. And, and so it's completely understood for those that, that got panicked. I've received so many messages from people that have had been able to watch it internationally that really like love the opportunity to actually hear Dari or Pashtu on screen. And that, that always makes me feel excited. But in the conversation of like representation, something I, I always mention is like, you get dozens of white shows like shows centered around white families or or you know storytelling about these things that miss the mark or fail and then they get to fail up right they get to fail up so it's like in when whenever it's like around an identity that's um not represented as much right it's like you've got to get it perfect or else you're going to fail and then you're not going to get another chance right because because it's so specific they're going to look at it and go well we can't do it again because that one didn't work right that's how hollywood works so it's like no actually the, all the shows that are centered around like you know your normal white storytelling they can have hundreds and hundreds of bad shows and then they can still go on and make more bad shows or good shows and then get the one hit or whatever so it's just so much pressure like you had said in that one space to like get it all right um, but i think they've been doing a wonderful job it's just like Did you want to, sorry, did you want to say something, Reza? No, I think oh, I, okay. I, I may have made a slight noise in it and the, <laughs> the screen suddenly went to me. It did, it did. Um, so I just wanted to come back to the idea of Muslim women, but particularly Afghan women on television, you just don't, A, you don't see them in scripted TV, period. Um, unless it's a joke and it's like Larry David making a joke, you know, and, or, uh, you know, and uh, it's, or it's some sort of horrible burka joke. And the, I think that is also what I really, really appreciate about the series is that it, again, it sounds basic, but there's an Afghan woman in that who actually is a person who has a personality, who has a backstory, who has, you know, who is, a character who is not just a burqa running through the scene for comedy's sake or for, you know, to depict a horrible uh, situation of war and oppression. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that because there's something just so refreshing about that. 
Yeah, look, I mean, this is the, it, w back to the previous conversation, this is what representation means. We, we, in this industry, we tend to talk about representation only when it comes to who's in front of the camera. But, you know, there are people who put words in the actor's mouth. And so the storytelling is done in the room. So if there's no representation in the room, I'm sorry, but it really doesn't matter to me what color uh, skin the actor has. Um, in, in our case, we have Afghan women who are writing about Afghan women. And we have Afghan men who are writing about Afghan men. And we have veterans, by the way, who are writing about veterans. Um, you know, I, the one thing that I'm most proud of, and I think that is truly revolutionary about this show, isn't that it's the first network television show ever with a, uh, a Muslim protagonist. It's that the room is made up of people that uh, whose stories we're telling, you know? and if you know, people in the audience who are not in the industry, this may seem like the most obvious and logical thing in the world. You're like, well, duh, of course. Yeah. You're gonna tell a story about veterans and Afghans, you should have a room full of veterans and Afghans. Like, doesn't that make sense? Yeah, except that that's just not how Hollywood works, right? Uh, you usually have white guys putting words in the mouths of you know, Afghan women. And so why are you, you're, you're surprised at the way that Afghan women are traditionally represented on screen? Well, it's because it's the people who put, put words in their mouths. And so for us, it was just a very basic um, thing that we, I'm not saying it was easy, we had to fight for it. I would say about half of our writer's room, this is their first writing gig. Wow. Um, this is the first writer's room they've ever been in. Um, and that for a 22 episode a year uh, CBS network sitcom is a big deal. You know, you usually fill those rooms with, you know, people who have, who have done this forever. Um, but again, you know, thanks to the leadership of, of Dave and Maria, the, the co-creators and, and the encouragement of Chuck Lorre, um, you know, we were able to insist that the room represents the stories that we are trying to tell. I know a lot of people sometimes when they'll see some of the foibles that Al gets into, you know, uh, there sometimes we'll get criticisms like, that's stereotypical, that's not real. Everything that has happened to Al has its roots in something that has happened to one of the Afghans in our room or someone, that, one of their family members or something like that. You know, that's where these stories come from. Yeah. We also, I mean, I think we should also talk about the fact that we spoke to dozens of interpreters, um, oh. uh, male and female, mm -hmm. while we're doing the pilot, before we sold the show, after we sold the show and had that long wait because of COVID and um, and and continue to do so. And people who, not, not just Afghan interpreters, but also Marines, um, and veterans, people who uh, you know, like, for instance, there's a whole storyline with Hasina, uh, Al's sister, who uh, vaccinates uh, children across Afghanistan. We spoke to the people who were doing that. And so, so yes, the stories are called from actual stories in, in reality, in real people. That's, that's what we've done. But representation, just to add to what Reza was saying, is that this this is in some ways something we've t all talked about theoretically, like this idea of representation and what it really means. So here's a show that has on-screen representation, writer's room representation. You have Reza and I who are execs on the show, exec producer on the show who sit at every... So we are in every... There is very little conversation that happens about this show that, that, that re there isn't representation in, right? And so the experiment is, can... Does that mean the show is successful? Does that, that, you know, because at the end of the day, this is an industry. It's about economics, right? So does representation translate into a successful show or does it not, you know? And that's sort of the experiment we're in. Um, that's the battle that we're fighting. Um, and, uh, and, 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 it's, and it's exciting. You know, this is the one we wanted and we're here doing it. And so representation does matter. And, and this is representation, period. Hmm. And um, 
I was going to just jump in and throw a couple questions in here that people were asking. We can go back and forth on this and talk in between, but um, somebody was an anonymous attendee. That's, that's their name. Um, <laughs> what doors do you see this opening for Afghans? And I suppose you can go as wide with that question as you want, whether it's in television or whether it is in terms of how Americans view them, if they are here, I don't know, but take that away. Zita, you want to put your activist hat on and, and answer that question? Because you're probably the <laughs> best. Looked like, Raheem looked like he had an answer. Oh, because yeah. I've had this thought. I think yeah, I could nice? see his thinking. <laughs> <going>. My wheels. <laughs> He, you know, he, we're, we're very close now, so I don't know how much yeah. he's my brother now, so I know him well. <laughs> I find that this show is just like on the talent side and just as like Afghan artists, I think it's very cool how this show has served as a scaffolding for other talented Afghan artists to come up, come aboard. Being like it, the, the writer's room being propagated with Afghan writers. And then like when the, when the show first came out, we didn't think to have Azita come on, but the scaffolding is there. And then she's been wonderful. And then there's more stories to explore in that area. And then I got to be in this episode as the brother. And these aren't things that you think about out the gate. But once you have a show like this built, then you just draw. It's a great bridge for, for opportunity for you know other Afghans. And I think that's really neat and cool that I didn't think about until I was in it. I love that answer. I wouldn't even have think of it. I wouldn't think of it in that way, but that's so smart. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing that I think is really important, it's something we do in our educational trainings. We're talking about in general people from the, these parts of the world, you know, all over um, Central and South Asia and the Middle East and North Africa. Um, it's really hard to um, find a lot of Canadian actors, right? There, like a lot of actors don't get the opportunity from the, those parts of the world, especially the men. Like the opening question was like, have you, like you were an actor in Hollywood, Fahim, like how many terrorist parts did you get? And that's sadly not a joke, right? That's the truth. And there's no shame in that. People have to pay their bills. And those are, you know, 50% of the opportunities that are gonna come their way, if not more. And so to have the opportunity to have a show full time with 22 episodes that even have an extra three or four, you get three or four extra male Afghan characters that get to build a comedy resume, mm -hmm. right? And so then maybe when the next, you know, show with an Afghan comedic lead and they need somebody who has that history, then you get someone who's done it because they had the United States about to build mm -hmm that muscle with and that tool with. I, I've never really done sitcom either. So it's a learning curve for me. Um, and I'm learning as I go so much every episode, but still even for me, who's been in the business for 17 years, you know, it's, it's always a little bit drama heavy or girl next door or whatever it was. And so these are some of the things in front of the camera that I think um, this kind of a show offers long term again like Fahim said you don't think about it but then you're like oh you know oh he's gonna find this um cool you know uh, live music show that he, they're gonna go on a date to and then all of a sudden you get live Afghan music and you get Afghan musicians you know there they go on the date and then so we get real live Afghan musicians and you get to experience this other aspect of it and then you have Afghan musicians have their music featured on the show and so forth and so forth and so I think that that's kind of a little bit of that space. And it's all about, you know, for in the industry specifically, it's resume building. It's, you know, you, how, who do you work with? Do you have experience? Can you get in the room? Can we trust you on a set? Do you know the lingo? Like, do you know what we're talking about when we're talking about working for the joke or this is a three or, you know, oh, turn this moment, whatever it is, like hit your mark, look at this camera, you know, all these things that like a lot of people from our cultures don't have that because they've been gate kept from it. So. That's, I think, a part of that, as well as like expanding on the writer's room and then kind of bringing in, um, you know, one of the, I think Gila has, um, and they work really closely on like bringing in authentic um, production and design elements and photographs and food and all these things that really kind of add to the texture of the storytelling. And it's all authentically Afghan. And so not only does it feed commerce directly into the Afghan community, because we're supporting these small businesses, but it's also expanding um, people's point of view and the re like what they really get to see about Afghan specific culture um, behind the scenes in that way. So those are some of the like smaller things too that kind of 
get impacted that we don't really think about. But it's not a business that just serves the eight of us, you know, the, the showrunners that you talk about, the writers that you talk about, or the actors you, you talk about. There's hundreds of people that are, you know, making music and we're buying flowers from and we're getting their photographs from and 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 so on. And, and you know, uh, Kasim's Kebab has the Afghan sweets and we like buy out the Afghan sweet store from this um, Afghan, uh, the, oh, there's a shop in the OC and like they come in and they deliver truck full of, of, uh, of rut and jalebi and like all the desserts and you know, all the different things. And so, you know, it's just a way that, that it does expand um, representation and it does feed back into the community in some small way, however it can. Mm. The only thing I would add to that, and I think those are all the right answers. The only thing I would add to that is that if you ask most of us who are from that part of the world, who are in this industry, um, for very few of us, this was the career idea that we planned for ourselves or the parents planned for ourselves. And, and, and that has a lot to do with the fact that a failure of imagination, right? When you, can't see, when you don't see people like yourself on television, then you can't imagine yourself being in those positions. When you don't see successful people in the arts, in your community, you don't tell your kids, yeah, go be a writer, go be an actor, right? right. We as a community, I say this, I've been saying this for 17, for 15 years now. Uh, I can't believe it's still valid, which is we care about how we look, right? So all our parents are like, look good. You got to get dressed right. You, you know, like my mom still goes crazy that I have a beard because she doesn't like it. I'm Iranian. <laughs> and for and so we are so obsessed with how we present right our families are culturally it's really important that you present well yet we've forgotten our face and what do i mean by that our face as community is our artists that's our face and yet we undervalue our artists as a community more than any other profession go be a doctor do anything don't be an artist right uh the artists um don't get the, the community support. There is no cultural centers that serve young artists who want to become playwrights and to act and to write, you know, to, to be cultivated. And, but, you know, but then we expect that representation to be there, right? We, we have to be able to call from a field of artists, like to be able to compete, you have to have a lot of people who are actually applying this trade. But we as artists, a lot of times, especially when we're struggling, we take it both from the industry, but also we take it from our own families and communities, right? We get it on both ends. You know, they're pissed off that we're here and other people, you know, you know, want to caricaturize us. And so I think the onus also is on the community and, and to make sure that we do that. And one of the most important ways a show like this makes long-term impact is by showing that it is possible a, to imagine yourself there, that's what you want to do, but also for the community to see that, oh my God, that is an avenue that is open to us. That is a coming of age of any immigrant community in this country. And in some ways, it's beautiful to be part of the coming of age story of our own communities with this show and other shows like it. Yes. I spoke to this, um, this young Muslim Women's Foundation at Harvard Kennedy two years ago and one of the young girls, you know, was very emotional um, for two reasons, which I, I always mention. One, um, through tears, she told me she's never heard her language spoken on television without it being in a violent way. She'd always heard her Arabic tongue being spoken in this like horrific, violent way. And mm. that was painful for her. And then the other ones mentioned, well, how do you handle people saying your name? Azita, how do you how do you how come you didn't change your name? And and I think that's something that's that's really lovely here is that um, we get to hear Pashto and Dari spoken um, through families communicating in fights, in you know in love, just in like a real traditional way, um, which is really groundbreaking because also a lot of the times on the shows that do feature Dari and Pashto, they're usually wrong. <laughs> they're usually like. <laughs> Pashto and Dari mixed, or sometimes they just throw an Arabic there and no, none of the producers care. They're like, just speak whatever language you speak and speak at each other. And you're like- they, just call, they call it gibberish. Like they used to just call it gibberish here. It's like, no, that's like an actual the, language. They're opening like, 24 and they're like Afghan and they're, or something. They yes. They're all yelling <laughs> Arabic. And then the other guy's yelling Pashto it. And, and I'm like, 
oh my God, this is wrong. Like, and, but nobody knows. And they're just like, yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh. So um, as far as the representation goes, it's really lovely to um, get messages from people that get to hear Awarmir and the various names, Bul Bashar and like all these things they get to hear um, on primetime. Um, there's two questions here. I'm gonna kind of tether them together because they get to the same thing. Someone asked, there seems to be gatekeeping going on in the industry and the show truly is remarkable at changing that. Are there educational programs or mentorship programs that we'll be launching through United States of Al? The second question is, how can more Afghan writers or aspiring directors and producers intern or apply to this show? A little more direct. <laughs> Um, well, I'll, I'll take the, the, the second one, um, write to us, you know, we're not, we're not difficult to find, um, and write to us. We're here. Uh, we already have, we are, what are, we, I think 10, um, 10, 11 Afghan between support staff, writers, actors. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot by, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, it's it's so lovely that it's the Afghan community, to be honest with you, but I don't think for any community, this is just not the way it works. So there's a lot of people already and we we and hopefully we're around long enough where we can keep, as as Fahim said, we have the scaffolding to be able to bring more people and and people from here go on to make other shows. Uh, you know, uh, so our writers and our writers will go on and do other shows, and then we have more people that can come in and bring in support staff there's production stuff i think it's really really important because production is dominated by it's all union work and unions are all about working your way up you know it's like it's an apprenticeship so you you know to be able to get people into the doors so that they can qualify to join the union and can work up in production jobs making these kinds of a shows is a, is a teamwork that includes you know we can't we couldn't have made this show without our you know all our crew you know it's really important to say it's not just us writers and producers and actors there is a huge and there is a ton of opportunities in that space as well so a show like this provides an opportunity to bring people on those places and so yeah get in touch with us if you want to get in and we'll do it i forgot what this first question was is that it's kind of the same thing yeah okay, was, right. yeah i i would also like to add um that the, my organization, um, the Mean Arts Advocacy Coalition, which is, is separate than this, but we're launching a digital database um, with thanks to some um, lovely donors that will actually, if you wanna join in the next um, couple of weeks, we'll be doing a live announcement. That will be um, a global platform for producers, studios and networks to access um, talent from these specific cultures because people are always looking and asking us like, I need an Iraqi speaking Arabic for the lead of Mazel. I need three Azita. And I'm like, okay. Um, so we're using technology to assist in that space and also to remove that gatekeeping that occurs in the business where you don't normally get seen on lists and whatnot. This will give producers direct access to your resume, your links of work, your photos, your biography your country of origin, languages you speak and all those things. So that when there is another show like US of Al or another show about Afghanistan or Iraq or Iran, um, they can go out there and kind of um, find some talent. It's not a guarantee, but it's a step to try to remove some of the gatekeeping. So um, check out our Instagram and Twitters and stuff for those. You want to say what it is, Azita? The... Oh, it's, a, it's a digital database. No, 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 the, what the is address. It? Oh, How oh do I get... uh, it's at Mina Advocacy. So, and, it, and, and, you know, and it's not fully announced yet, but um, our database is partnered with the Academy. It's new inclusion and standards. So it'll be on the Oscars website um, as one of their partners. So all producers for the Oscars um, that are looking for Oscars, uh, that want to be nominated for the Oscars and looking for diverse talent above and below the line will have access to our database. So it'd be cool. Um, okay, and someone here asked, could you speak to the public commentary about not casting an Afghan actor in the lead role? Sure. Um, well, I think that the, the question is, is, is kind of funny about because it sounds like the intention was not to cast an Afghan. Well, the intention was completely the opposite. Where we 
from the beginning, our whole goal was, all right, how do we get Afghans in all aspects of this? I have to tell you that we were certainly as much as adamant about making sure we have Afghans in the room. In fact, more so because that's where we felt the most difficult cha challenge is going to be than, than on screen. Like that was like, okay, we cannot have even just one Afghan is not enough in a room. Like there needs to be proper representation in the room and veterans, you know? So that was the key thing for us. With casting, the way casting works is that you put a casting call out and then you do your best to support the casting agents to get as many people that are out there to come and um, to come and audition. We saw a lot of people who were really, really good. Uh, but as uh, as Azita said, this is a multicam uh, that at that point pre-COVID was still going to happen in front of a live audience. It has its own specific things. Azita has been in the industry 17 years. She says she hasn't done a sitcom yet. Right? It's not an easy job. Um, and it takes very particular skills and, um, and you have, you know, and, and so we have to, at the end of the day, uh, make a decision about what's, who can, uh, very specifically deliver all aspects of this, um, of this part and, uh, and be very objective about the people that came, you know, we saw dozens and dozens of Afghan actors, um, from all over the place, you know, we expanded the network to other countries. Uh, you know, we're looking at Zoom auditions when before Zoom was the thing that has become. Um, but at the end of the day, um, Adir, you know, stood head and shoulders above everybody else. And he had all the skills that we felt was necessary. And, and by then we had already Afghan colleagues and, um, and, you know, and it was a decision that we made collectively. Uh, uh, and uh, and we're thank God we made it because I don't think the show would be where it is um, without uh, Adir. And 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 one of the things I kept saying around promises was, you know, let's say you you hire you know at a sitcom suddenly something like Promises comes around, like an event that that inspired Promises, I should say, an event like what happened in, in Afghanistan happens. Most shows will just shrink away and disappear just because they're not equipped to be able to tell that story. Uh, but we had, we had the staff to be able to tell that story. We had those perspectives. We also had the actors to be able to deliver that story. But very, but what Adir had to carry an incredibly difficult part. I mean, it is such a difficult part to play, specifically in that episode. Mm. Um, and, and he wasn't hired because he was going to be able to deliver that kind of a range. And yet he has it. And I think anyone who uh, anyone who saw that episode can now appreciate the talent that this man has and the sensitivity and the love he's brought to representing this, this community um, and everything that he's doing to support um, and, and the professionalism that he has is uncanny, you know, and, and, and that's just somehow, sometimes how the, how, how things go. Um, and I hope people will really grow to appreciate and love Adir as much as we love him and respect him because he deserves all of it. Yeah. And that just points to the fact that, you know, more Afghans need to be in the arts to have a larger pool to draw from for opportunities like this. Because at, at the end of the day, it has to serve, your talent level has to be at a level to support something like this. Yeah, yeah I mean, Fahim, you know, that even that experience on Promises, it's just so, it's so difficult. The timing is so intense and it like, it moves so fast and you know, sitcom is not like normal acting, like everything's in a box and it moves like every piece of the box has to fit. And if you miss a comma or the period, then that box falls <laughs> and then the whole thing, the whole scene collapses. And that's not like, you know, like the acting that I've been, you know, come up with, which is they want, you want to feel things, you want to experience things, you want to have the moment and like, they're, they're, like the moments are fast. There's, they pack thousands of moments in that. And that's, that's just really rare. And you know, Fahim's right, you need to have, we need to continue to build more, more actors from our community specifically so that we can have a larger pool to, to draw from, but. Um, and there was an initial search for, for an Afghan lead. Oh, oh, I mean, from, I mean, even through, through everybody, I mean, through casting, through CBS, through the producers, through everybody was looking. I know dozens of 
um, Afghan friends that read for it and stuff that just, you know, were inc are incredible actors and have all continued to audition for the show and we'll find a place on it if, you know, it's right. But at the moment it, it wasn't. And he's been, I mean, he's so, he's so committed to honoring the culture and yeah. the language, right? And it's really lovely. Um, we're going to have to wrap up in a second. I just wanted to read someone's comment to kind of wrap this up um, from Jalen Moore. It says, yes, exclamation point, exclamation point. May the sitcom show Hollywood that Afghans are here in the industry, have a voice, talent, and beautiful stories to tell. I hope the success of the show inspires more showrunners and networks to create even more. Keep shining and rising. Thank you for representing and doing your best to stay authentic. That's okay. awesome. That is beautiful. Um, thank you. Thank you all for being um, here. Um, Lorraine, did you get that? Uh, we have to, to Joseph. Yes. Yes. I'm going to throw this back to Joseph in a second. I just wanted to say thanks to the MPAC Hollywood Bureau. I'm going to throw this back to Joseph. Um, it's sorry, this is a little messy here at the end. It was a last minute thing. Hello, Joseph. <laughs> Thank you, Lorraine. You. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lorraine. Yeah, um, I, I think we had a tech glitch in the beginning and it was actually a blessing because I think listening to this conversation has really um, informed my comments even further. Yeah, I think it all, for, for the foundation, um, it comes back to the people that this is going to help. And when we talked about doing this event with MPAC, we thought about Fahim and we thought about Azita and all of those that would come after them. But we also thought about the 400,000 Afghans who are here already. We thought about the 100,000 that are going to show up. Um, we thought about the 6 million living outside of Afghanistan right now. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I think someone made a comment about um, this being about opening doors. And it's interesting because it's gone from opening doors for folks like Fahim and Azita to literally opening doors in Tulsa and in Wisconsin and in Sacramento and all over Texas. And so from an AAF perspective, you know, our, our hope is that we continue to have these conversations in our community, because that's really important. But also that we realize that, you know, we've met with folks at the White House, for example, and members of Congress, but what we really need to get to is, you know, the, the heart of America, right? We have to reach those people to impact the narrative building. We have to reach those people to kind of um, push against the threat narratives that are existing and emerging. And so, um, you know, we're grateful for this opportunity, Lorraine, for you facilitating and, and certainly for the folks from the show. And, and our hope, and I, I speak on behalf of Sue, is that this isn't the last conversation we have about this. And that really, um, we try to leverage this platform and this show to help in a way that it wasn't um, even conceived of being able to help three months ago. So um, just want to close with that. And, and again, Lorraine, thank you for a phenomenal job in, in guiding us tonight. And to, of course, Areza, Mahia, uh, Azita, and Fahim for their time. Thank you all. This was great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.